And welcome back to another episode of our deep dive reading and discussion of Sean McMeekin's 2021 book, Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. Joining me to discuss Section 2, Chapter 8, Maximum Danger, Finland, Baku, and the Khitan Massacre, I'm joined none other than the esteemable Pete Quinones. How are you, sir? Doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Really excited to get into this. Um, as I ask all of our... Uh, guests who come on with this book discussion um you know what are your I, I know you've read this already or at least have bits and pieces of it what are what are your general impressions of, of mr mcmeekin's work here i really do find this to be one of the most important mainstream historical books to come out in the last at least since in the last 20 years well it's even kind of hard to call it mainstream considering he, he's not talking about court history here um, very, I mean, you have to get into some serious volumes to um, even have discussions of like what was happening on the Finnish border in 1940. Um, so, I mean, this is the, a, a friend of mine read this about a year ago and just kept screenshotting and putting stuff into our chat and putting stuff into our chat and we were having discussions about it. Yeah, this is... Uh, this goes beyond what you would normally the normal kind of concentrate on the main characters the churchills the the hitlers the uh the mussolinis and the stalins and goes way deeper and he he mentions people in here that uh you know like uh vasily bloken and people like that that you're just not going to get in other books because um well, let's face it, the academia was taken over by people who are um, sympathetic to these people. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is great. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess maybe my mainstream, I, I do mean that Sean McMeekin is a very respectable mainstream historian. I mean, his, his volume of work is, is fantastic stuff. I, I do recommend people look into his books on the Russian Revolution uh, the outbreak of World War One. I. I mean, he's a he's a very good historian. But yeah, no, this this goes far more in depth in ways. Just reading through it here with guests that I would have never imagined would be that much detail. And the thing I love about history books, especially ones like these, are the footnotes and the records that he's gone into to make this, you know, as very readable and accessible as possible. But there's so much information crammed in here. Like you could spend another you know, three years just going through the, the footnotes and sources and all sorts of rabbit holes. But um, let, let's just get started with it today. So, yeah, we're, we're covering um, right at chapter seven just ended. So we, we, we just finished off the, um, you know, finish, um, you know, finish Russo war. And we're now going to see how what it takes to break Finland and also to get their sort of ceasefire and the worst that also comes with Poland. But we'll get into it. Okay. After beginning so well with the carve-up of the already defeated Poland and the helpless Baltic states, Stalin's war had taken a perilous turn in Finland. It was not only in the Karlelian Isthmus sector that his armies had failed. North of Lake Ladoga, the two entire Soviet rifle divisions were nearly obliterated in the Battle of Tovrejari in December 1939 by a few lightly armed Finnish battalions. Further north, the story was worse still. In a series of battles near Susalami in the late December and early January of 1940, which saw Finnish ski troops at their lethal best, the Soviet 44th and 63rd Divisions were basically annihilated. After the last Russian resistance was snuffed out on January 8th, William Trotter writes in Frozen Hell, Finnish spotters counted the stone-stiff bodies of 27,500 27, Russian soldiers, along with the remains of 43 tanks and 270 trucks. Finnish war booty included 48 artillery pieces, 300 machine guns, and a motley but welcome assortment of trucks and armored cars. Sulsal Salmi was a Soviet humiliation. Yeah, this is, uh, this would probably be a surprise to people who aren't familiar with the 1922 Finland Russia War, uh, what was called the East Karelian Uprising, and where basically Finland put them down in a month. And that's something that people just, again, 
most mainstream historians are not going to talk about. Charles Haywood does a really has a really good write up and a really good episode on that uh, on the um, the Worthy House, uh, his website and his podcast. And uh, yeah, they're the Soviets. Uh, Soviets and Russia in general never had very good luck against Finland. Finland always seems to have their number. It's very strange. You know, it's almost like a, you know, a, a sports team who's just dominating, dominating against most teams. And they have that one team that they just can't figure out. And they're not anywhere near, you know, they, they're, there's no reason that they should beat them. And Finland just steps up and keeps doing that over and over again to Russia. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we were, I had uh, a, a writer on Nicholas Sorokin. He covers some of this stuff as well. And he was just like, you know, outside of Charles Haywood's coverage of it, and even Charles's stuff was very clear that there's not a lot of English uh, sources on what happened here. And um, the fact that they were going up against Finland again, Stalin made this a very personal, emotional thing and poor, you know, poor planning. And, and here we go. But we'll carry on. Only in the far north on the Arctic front has the Red Army troops performed well, and this was largely because Finnish defenses there were weakest, consisting of only a single company and artillery bat battery. The Soviet 104th Division, supported by the guns of the Soviet Arctic Fleet, conducted a smooth amphibious strike against Petsamo. Although the town was of strategic importance because of the nearby deposits of high-grade nickel and its port on the Barent Sea, its capture by the Russians in early December 1939 did Stalin little immediate good. After the port froze over, it was all the 14th Army could do to hole up and wait for spring, even while the Finnish and Lop, the Sami, ski snipers picked off hundreds of unfortunate Russians guarding the supply road to Murmansk. Meanwhile, the Soviet capture of Petsamo, though a lone bright spot for the Red Army in a depressing winter, alarmed both Stalin's German allies, who relied on Petsamo nickel for its panzer production, and the British and French, who feared the Soviet encroachment against Norway. Just a couple things here real quick. Um, yeah, go for it. He's talking about the, snipe, the snipers. Um, he, could, he could be... Um, I'm surprised he didn't mention here... Um, I believe you pronounce his name, Simo Haya. He was a legendary, legendary Finnish sniper who, according to legend, probably less, took out 500 Russians alone um, in the frozen tundra. And yeah, the they just didn't have an they didn't have an answer for um, Finnish snipers who turned out to be so <laughs> so um <laughs> proficient at what they did um also you know when you see right here um we, we start getting into talking about how so much of this when you were like well why finland why this place why that well nickel i mean all you know when you it's like i talked to people about world war ii and i talked to them about romania uh you know where i live for a little for a, a short period of time and people are like well wh why was what was romania it's like well the oil fields it's like so the thing I like about this chapter, too, is he starts getting into um, some of the materials and some of the reasons why uh, some of these areas needed to be um, secured and taken and secured. Yeah, he does talk about uh, Selma, Ohio and a few other important uh, economic resources for resource extraction in the previous chapter, which, you know, goes into why why Finland and also why so much of an emphasis on the uh, Baltic states. Okay. But he does, he, yeah, he does make reference to it. Awesome. On February 5th, 1940, the Anglo-French Supreme War Council met in Paris. With Poland loss and little appetite in the British and French high command for a frontal assault on the Germans' heavily fortified Siegfried line in the West, the soviet Finnish war seemed to offer the best chance for the Allies to strike a blow against Hitler and Stalin. If Norway allowed in British or French troops, the Allies could cut off Hitler's supply of iron ore from the Galviator mines in northern Sweden, along with nickel from Petsamo, the latter now controlled by Hitler's Soviet allies, who were holding on for dear life. The British Admiralty, on Churchill's orders, had begun a contingency planning for a Norwegian operation, Catherine, as early as September 1939, but Norway had not given permission. The French favored a more direct approach, landing 50,000 Allied troops, including a Polish expeditionary force, at Petsamo to strike a dual blow to Stalin and Hitler. 
But Churchill and the British Admiralty, which would be providing the naval transports and escorts, remained cool to a Barents Sea operation at Petsamo, favoring a Norwegian operation instead. Significant as Petsamo was, the most vulnerable spot for both dictators lay south at Baku, whence came three quarters of Soviet petroleum production, oil that was also fueling Hitler's war machine. On January 6, 1940, the British War Cabinet discussed bombing the Soviet Caucasus. Many of Britain's area experts, such as Fitzroy MacLean, the colorful ex-diplomat who had explored Soviet Central Asia while posted to Moscow in the late 1930s, were hostile to the idea because of the possibility of provoking Russian moves against Iran or Afghanistan. Though noting McLean's dissent, the War Cabinet resolved on January 30th, 1940, the closeness of Soviet-German cooperation may lead us to send an expedition to Finland in the near future. and the circumstances, it is clearly of importance that we should know what prospects we have of taking effective action against the Soviet Union. British air chiefs were instructed to look into an aerial strike on Baku. Just a, a real quick, I mean, this is another one of those books that shows that Everybody assumes because of the books they've read that the Soviet Union was always on the side of the West, uh, that there was no German cooperation, that there were no. I mean, the thing about this book is it explains the complexity of the situation, especially the situation on the ground. And that's not something that you're especially now maybe when i was a kid maybe when i was in high school but i don't think that this is the kind of book that they want to put into a high school even now because there is a lot of complexity to it and this is the kind of book that actually could be studied for a semester but it also reveals some things that they don't want to get out in the open yeah i mean like i said at the beginning just the footnotes alone you could spend years going down the rabbit hole for some of these uh, you know, firsthand accounts and primary sources. And to to understand, as uh, we've gone through in previous chapters, just the sheer amount of leverage that Stalin had over, you know, Hitler's regime, you know, we're, we're told by almost all mainstream academics, our media culture, that World War II is explicitly Hitler's conflict and Hitler's war. And, you know, we're, we're having uh, a well-known mainstream historian offer the record saying that, that may not necessarily be the case. Uh, again, you, you could spend a whole semester on this book, and even then, it's not something we'd see supported that publicly. Mm -hmm. By February 1940, loose talk of Allied plans to go to war with the Soviet Union was all over London and Paris, spreading through the bazaars of the Middle East, too. In Ankara, modern-day Turkey, the British military attaché, Sir Hugh Noctable Hugesson, opened unofficial conversations with the Turkish foreign minister, um, Mehmet Sokro Sakralo about the possibility of starting subversive activities in the Soviet Union. On February 13th, the British Council in Tehran reported to the Iranian Prime Minister had sought him out and threw out hints of staff conversations about the possibility of striking Russian oil interests in the Caucasus. The Iranian War Minister had called in the British military attaché and told him that the time had come for Iran and Britain to coordinate plans for war against Russia. Iran's position, at least, was thus clear. To cover possible re repercussions in South Asia in case of a British war against the Soviet Union, Noctable Hugesson had sought out the Afghan ambassador to Ankara, Faiz Mohammed Khan. Khan told him that if Stalin's troubles in Finland continued much larger, Bukhara, Kiva, Smarkland, Fagana were all disaffected and ripe for trouble. In fact, the whole Muslim element in Russia was ready for revolt if Russia's present difficulties continued long. No doubt much of this was just idle talk. Even so, it is significant that British diplomats opened discussions with Iran and Turkey about airstrikes against the Soviet Caucasus, because any such airstrikes, whether carried out from French bases in Syria or British air bases in Iraq, would have to cross Turkish or Iranian airspace. Nor was the Afghan connection irrelevant to the prospect of an allied agreement with Turkey and Iran. Turkey had signed an alliance agreement in 1937 with Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan, the Sadabad Pact, which could easily be activated against the Soviet Union in case of war. Such multilateral negotiations may have been tentative and non-committal, but they were a necessary preliminary, uh, necessary preliminary to armed action against Stalin. It was a really good, uh, really good decision not to uh, activate that pact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that just who knows? Well, I mean, who knows what direction the war? I'm saying for them 
it's a really good um idea that they didn't activate that pact it, it could have changed the uh the war if they did but yeah we'll never know now yeah like in the previous chapter we were witnessing such a great disaffectation from the japanese the italians the french the the norwegians and the british that you would have had one of the strangest coalitions of, of fascists and liberal democracies <laughs> uh and asiatic imperialists wanting to go to war against the soviet union and Nick Meekin gives you this little slice of a different world, a different timeline, and we'll never know what it would have, what would have happened, but, you know, different than our current history. The idea of Turkey joining a war against the Soviet Union was far from fanciful. Republican Turkey, breaking the traditional Ottoman pattern of enmity, had been friendly with Soviet Russia in the 1920s and 30s out of shared antipathy to the Western powers, dating to the British-French carve-up of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. Relations had, however, cooled considerably in recent years. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact had alarmed Ankara enough that Turkey began negotiating a mutual assistance pact with Britain and France in September 1939, concluded on October 19th, which Stalin, having hitched the Soviet star to Nazi Germany, the country at war with those powers, interpreted it as a hostile act. Stalin summoned Turkey's foreign minister to a rude dressing down in the Kremlin on October 1st, 1939, after making him cool his heels waiting for a week. Was the British-French-Turkish pact, Stalin asked Sarapolu, directed against the Soviet Union? Were Turkey's agreements with Romania, Yugoslavia, and Greece dating to 1934, the Balkan Entente, designed to counter German aggression, or Soviet? The Vaud's blankly bluntly reminded Sarlo that the sad fate of Poland, Warsaw had just fallen three days earlier, observed that Romania, like Poland, has too much territory, and asked whether Turkey's commitments would require her to go to war against the Soviet Union if Romania refused to give us Bessarabia, and Stalin went to war with Bucharest. Honestly, Stalin reminded Sarakolu that Britain and France, Turkey's proposed partners, had chosen to declare war on Germany and not Russia, even though we had carved up Poland together. But, as Stalin pointed out, they might do so at any time, and then we would have to fight Britain and France. In that case, where would Turkey stand? Molotov demanded a Turkish pledge that any military obligations undertaken towards Paris and London must be immediately voided in case Britain and France attack the Soviet Union. Sarakolu assured Molotov that Turkey would comply, and he did, inserting a secret opt-out clause in the final pact with Britain and France in case those powers went to war with the Soviet Union. It's amazing. And I just, um, I'm looking at this and talking about Romania. Um, I just, my interest, because I, I was, I lived there for a while. Um, it, I always ask myself, what would, what would Romania have looked like if Kodrianu hadn't been assassinated and if his party could have been in power and the this could, the war <laughs> the, the turns it could have taken for the war is uh, it's amazing <laughs> yeah i mean again the mcmeekin just teases out all these alternative possibilities for what could have been <laughs> In this view of diplomatic bullying in Moscow, it is unsurprising that Serokolu responded to the British Atteche's overture in Ankara by begging for the chance to settle the scores with Stalin. As early as October 1939, the Turkish foreign minister had mischievously informed the French military attaché in Ankara that Stalin was terrified of a British aerial assault from bases in Iraq and the oil installations of the Caucasus. On January 2nd, 1940, the British communist paper, The Daily Worker, ran a cover story on plans hatching to extend war to Near East, which claimed to have information from, quote, reliable sources that France and Britain were plotting to attack the Soviet Union with half a million Turkish troops, 400,000 French troops based in Syria, and a token, uh, and a token British force consisting mostly of air support. While these numbers were fanciful, the Daily Worker story shows that there was serious concern in Moscow about Stalin's vulnerable Caucasian underbelly. Hmm. In mid-February 1940, these plans took on a more serious aspect when Turkey's military attaché in London broached the subject with the director of British military intelligence. The allies, the Turkish attaché proposed, could cripple Russia, and it was a matter in which our staff should get together and form a plan. 
in view of indications which the Turks have given lately of awakening interest in the future of the Turkish elements in Caucasia, the war office concluded, it was likely that the Turkish military attaché's remarks were not made without some sort of suggestion from Ankara. Sarakoglu was likely the source. Such talks were carried out in secret, but a mere volume of the conversation was the subject that sparked press leaks. On February 22, 1940, the London News Chronicle ran a provocative cover story on the Siegfried Line in the Caucasus, claiming that Allied and German engineers were racing to complete fortifications on the Russian and Turkish sides of the mountains before spring. The London Times reported that the Turkish and Soviet troops had exchanged fire in Caucasian border clashes, and that the Germans, concerned for Hitler's Caucasian oil supplies, had dispatched engineers to Batumi. The Telegraph speculated that Allied reinforcements in the Middle East pretended an attempt to capture Caucasian oil fields. So damaging were these exaggerated, but basically true in the last case, stories that the Foreign Office lodged complaints with the editors of the Times and Telegraph. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> However, dubiously reported, Stalin took rumors of Allied and Turkish intervention against vital Soviet oil supplies very seriously. On January 21st, 1940, the Fats had informed the Politburo that it is not us, but the Turks who are ruining themselves. We are quite satisfied that we have freed ourselves from any sort of friendship with Turkey. Even if the French were more enthusiastic about attacking the USSR, Stalin was more terrified of a British intervention and the view of both Britain's genuine naval and aerial capacity and his own recollection, however distorted by time and ideology of the British intervention against the Reds in the Russian Civil War, especially the Baltic region, but also briefly in Baku and Azerbaijan in 1918. Stalin and Molotov had asked the Soviet ambassador in London, Ivan Maisky, to call Britain's bluff. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> On February 24th, 1940, Maisky relayed a request from the Soviet government to Britain's Undersecretary of State, R.A. Rob Butler, uh, that London pass on Stalin's proposed peace terms in Finland. If Britain refused Stalin's request, Maisky told Butler, in a manner Butler found both ridiculous and sinister, the attitude taken up by His Majesty's government in this question might have unforeseen consequences. Maisky admonished Butler with a Russian proverb, Britain should be content to seize a titmouse when you had the opportunity to not look upwards in the sky for a crane. The idea that Britain was refusing to bring our two countries closer together, in view of the fact that the British people had been deeply stirred by the unprovoked attack of the Soviet Union upon a small and friendly country, Butler replied, what Maisky was actually saying Britain to do, endorse Stalin's territorial demands on Finland, was to swallow a crane and hope later for a titmouse. Butler concluded that Stalin's motive was to try and prove that it is we who are and always been egging on the Finns and trying to sabotage the theater of war. Hmm. Yeah, Finland, I know we're going to get more into Finland here, but it's just, uh, let's reiterate, it's absolutely amazing how you would think the Russians, considering the the terrain, the environment they grow that they grow up and that they live in that going into finland wouldn't be this but it's they always they in other books they complain about that they complain about oh how the wind and the weather and i'm just like well i mean it's basically the same thing <laughs> but this is a, this is just such a tactic this is such a tactical blunder um well, not a tactical blunder. I mean, I understand the the reason for going into Finland, but to not just, I mean, a full on assault, which then when we get further in the chapter, you see how many people he puts on the uh, on the border. And it's just like, well, <laughs> the number seems astronomical, but he basically what he had to do at the point at that point. Yeah, absolutely. If this was Stalin's intention, then Butler and his colleagues were doing nothing to dissuade him. In Moscow, Britain's embassy secretary, John Le Rucatel, had made arrangements to have the U.S. embassy take over diplomatic functions in case Britain declared war. In London, the War Office commissioned reports in February 1940 on the Soviet oil industry and its vulnerabilities, on the geography of the Transcaucasus, including the location of oil wells, refineries, and pipelines, on public opinion inside the Soviet Union, and the morale in the Red Army. The most imaginative British move was the decision by the War Office in early February 1940 to send two Russian-speaking English officers, 
Rush um, Major R.O.A. Gatehouse and Captain C.H. Tamplin to Finland to visit prisoner of war camps and debrief captured Soviet troops. In the end, they spoke to uh, 2,075 men. The resulting report provides an astonishing snapshot of the Red Army morale during the Finnish war and the state of public opinion across a broad section of the Soviet population in the first winter of the Second World War. The overwhelming impression was of a common experience of horror. These war prisoners were men who, Gatehouse and Tamplin concluded, had undergone, in most cases, undescribable hardship and privation, who had been warned that they would be shot or tortured uh, to death if captured. They were still in terror of their own command personnel, the politrucks, the political commissars. They had been browbeaten, bullied, starved, frozen, half-killed, and mutilated, and some of them still did not believe that they were not going to be shot. Some of the Soviet war prisoners had been shot and left for dead by their own commanders or seen their friends shot. Others had liquidated their superiors. Most had been shocked by the humanity and kindness extended to them by their captors and had been told by Meklis's politrucks that the Finns would torture and murder them. They found this gentle behavior so surprising that it had left them disillusioned about their own home country. <laughs> I think in hindsight, we can look back and... Uh understand their disillusionment oh a hundred percent right but uh, again the this that, that paragraph speaks for itself yes <laughs> it's just good good god disillusionment with communism did not necessarily portend a political awakening however nearly all of those interviewed refused to be returned home as exchanged prisoners of war as they were confident of being instantly shot and terrified that dire retribution would fall on their families the basic attitude of a Soviet soldier citizen towards life, Major Gatehouse and Captain Tamplin concluded, was that of an obvious fatalism. They accept the persecution in civil life and the brutal discipline of military life, the permanent shortage of food and clothes, and the ordering, herding, and hectoring by the Soviet state as being the dictate of an unkind fate. And I'm sure many of them had heard the stories of even commanding officers that had returned from Spain just you know, a year or two before, who, even though they may have been successful in their command, were executed. I mean, Stalin, people, officers that were sent to Spain were executed upon returning just because Stalin was in the middle of his his purge. So um, these things would have been common knowledge to men who had been in the military, especially if they were in the military before the war. Absolutely. And I mean, once you had the introduction of political commissars, you saw it up close and personal. I mean, rumors of purges were not, you know, a, a hush hush thing. It was a very open secret that you were very well aware of, or you knew someone who knew someone who was taken away or executed. So yeah, that, that kind of fatalism of just knowing that I'm I'm a dead man either way is a totally understandable state of mind to be in. Yeah, when you when you understand when Thomas says that at one point Stalin was the most powerful man in the world, especially after he got the bomb, you, you understand when you look at the things that he did. I mean, you someone like you or me would like to be the most powerful man in the world and have the res, have respect. He was just happy being feared and being the most feared man on the planet. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's the, the running gag, would you, do you rather be loved or feared? But um, I, I think Stalin's uh, brutalism, I think shows you that you can, you can rule pretty effectively by fear. Uh, this is where, you know, one, one man's death's a tragedy, a million's a statistic. And he didn't have a problem with statistics. <laughs> no, no. The War Office's rationale for sending Gatehouse and Tamplin to Finland was to gauge the odds that an internal rebellion might destabilize Stalin's regime in case Britain went to war with the Soviet Union. But those odds didn't look good. The ignorance of the average Red Army soldier was abysmal, with a large number hardly literate, despite the Soviet regime's vaunted literacy campaign of the 1920s. Twenty years of underfeeding, Gatehouse and Tamplin observed, resulted in a very low standard of physique and a lack of stamina. The two hours of atheist agitprop Red Army grunts endured from their politrucks every day produced apathy. Rush, the Russian marches to war with a revolver at his back and prefers the chance at death at the hands of the enemy to the certainty of death if he refuses, they explained. Patriotism as such, the authors wrote, was dead. 
Yeah, that's a tough paragraph. Yeah. The only thing that seemed to inspire enthusiasm among the Soviet peoples was religion, in which they showed a lively interest. In the negative sense, the resentment of Stalin's collectivization drive, uh, collectivization drive lingered. The kolkhoz, or the collective farms, was end to end of Russia, and the most hated institution in the land. For this reason, Ukrainians, who had suffered the most under collectivization, retained something of a national consciousness and seemed the most promising for recruiting agents provocateurs. In some, Gatehouse and Tamplin concluded, the overthrow of the Soviet government can only be achieved by foreign military intervention. Well, he definitely got that right about the Ukrainians. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that, that last part seems to, has not as aged as well. Uh, well, we haven't completely intervened in Russia, yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> by a proxy it has not worked out the way that the Western leaders have thought. Uh, whether or not an internal rebellion was in the offing, the British were getting serious about intervening against the Soviet Union. On March 5th, 1940, Field Marshal Edmund Ironside, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, called in his subordinate officers. Ironside did not think Britain was prepared for war with Russia, but he was under pressure from the war cabinet, where, Churchill aside, sentiment against the Russians was increasingly belligerent. The war cabinet would like to force it on, Ironside informed his staff. They should work on the assumption that if Russia comes into the war, we shall at once begin bombing the Baku oil fields probably sometime in April. It was expected that bombing sorties, if to be carried out twice a week from Iraqi bases by two squadrons of Blenheims, would require five to 12 weeks to knock out the major Soviet oil installations, pipelines, and refineries in Baku and Batumi. Anti-Soviet war fever was running high in London. Even the skeptical Fritz Fitzroy McLean had begun to come around. Once Baku's petroleum supplies were cut off, McLean wrote on March 6th, the industrial and agricultural effort of the Soviet Union would be paralyzed, and there could be no questions of any further Soviet help to Germany. McLean had been floored by a report submitted in February by an American petroleum engineer returning from a stint in Baku who said that there were no real defenses against any serious attack. There were no anti-aircraft guns, and the refineries at Baku could easily be occupied or destroyed, even though they were um, in three totally independent units. Equally, Baku bottom pipelines could not be defended against a determined attack. The best hope of making trouble in the Soviet Union, McLean concluded, was in Transcaucasia. So long as Britain and France, the French had 60,000 troops in Syria under the command of Maxime Weygand, obtained active support of Turkey. Turkey remained the wild... Oh, got something there? Okay. Uh, Turkey remained the wild card. Serokoglu had expressly promised Stalin that Ankara would not be dragged into a British-French war against the Soviet Union. Turkey had still not authorized British or French war warships to transit the Straits into the Black Sea, which ruled out the Admiralty's planned naval strikes on Batumi. On the other hand, Sarakolu was dropping hints that he would welcome an allied aerial strike against Baku while maintaining Turkish deniability. The tricky part was that a British strike on Baku would have to be carried out from RAF bases in northern Iraq over Iranian airspace, which would require con um, connivance from Baghdad and Tehran, whereas a French strike uh, must originate in Syria, requiring the use of Turkish airspace. <laughs> it's, you're... <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't. For me to direct. Yeah, like there's there's no winning out of this one. You, and I mean, you're gonna, it, yeah, you, you're gonna owe, you're gonna owe so many favors after that. <laughs> and yeah, and I mean, at, at this point in time, Turkey does have uh, the the ultimate sort of deniability playing card because this is after the Montreux Convention in 1936, where basically, if you want to get into the Black Sea from the Darndells you got to get Turkey's approval and they've got a unilateral veto about military craft coming in. And in fact, you know, the, the last time that we've seen it been enacted was at the beginning of the, the current war in Ukraine. It was like the first time. And since it's more or less it's creation and signing that it's been used that way. So um, the Turks basically said the Westerners can't get into the black sea right now. <laughs> um so, but yeah, again, this was an interesting piece of diplomatic history, uh, both that relates to this this ongoing conflict uh, in Ukraine, but also World War II. Mm -hmm. 
For this reason, the French were pressing harder in Ankara than the British. In early March 1940, Serkolu dropped a tantalizing hint to the French ambassador, René Massili, that Turkey might look the other way if the Allies violated its airspace. Massilia noted to Sarakolu that the Allied bombers targeting Soviet oil installations in Transcaucasia would have to fly over either Persian or ter Turkish territory, both of whom might be neutral. Sarakolu immediately replied, Massili told his British counterpart, so you fear a protest from Iran, implying to Massili there'd be no special need to fear a protest from Turkey. This is certainly how Massili's report was interpreted in Paris, where the commander-in-chief, Gamelin, who had previously expressed concern about diverting troops away from France, was now arguing there are other places than the Western Front where the war may be fought. Lending a friction to these allied intrigues in Ankara was a Caucasian exile organization known as Prometheus, which also had branches in Istanbul and Paris. As if to roll all of Stalin's nightmares into one great conspiracy, Prometheus, with Ukrainian, Muslim Caucasian, and even Georgian branches, which had been subsidized by the Polish government, its first headquarters was in Warsaw, still maintained contact with the Poles' exile government in London. Fitzroy MacLean, already on Stalin's radar after he had sought to evade his NKVD minders in the late 1930s, was on friendly terms with Prometheus leaders, including Said Shamil. Shamil was the legendary grandson of Imam Shamil, who had tormented the Russians in a Caucasian holy war lasting from 1832 to 1859. Imam Shamil's son had also fought for Turkey during the Russo Ottoman War of 1877 to 1878. Saeed Shamil sought out General Wagon in Beirut, asking for French arms and logistical support for a new jihad against Stalin. Shamil also met with McLean in London to discuss the idea. Go ahead. Uh, again, you know, this alternate timeline of what could have been. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh of course, Stalin could not have known every detail about these plots and plans against him. He knew an impressive amount, though, and not just from leaks in the British newspapers. Soviet archives have revealed the existence of a double agent, number 59 in the NKVD files, who regularly met with ranking French, British, and Polish officers and provided Stalin's NKVD intelligence chief, Beria, with reliable reports on Allied strategic planning. Agent 59 was almost certainly a Georgian Mingrelian former Menshevik named Michael Kidia, known personally to Beria and Stalin since childhood. Kidia was so thoroughly penetrated the Allied military establishment that General Wagon hired him in Beirut as a principal advisor on Caucasian affairs. <laughs> With the help of Agent 59, Beria was also able to provide Stalin access, as a Russian historian discovered after the Soviet archives were opened in 1991 verbatim texts of high-level documents within the French and British general staff, as well as internal communications between key French and British officers. Wigan's plans to strike at Baku were so well known to Moscow that Soviet consuls casually discussed them with friendly colleagues, Bulgarian diplomats, for example, as early as February 14, 1940. It's an, an amazing asset to have in there. To just be able to get verbatim texts. Ugh. I mean, like, you can talk about Soviet war doctrine or anything, but I mean, it was Soviet intelligence was something completely on another level. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's why people like, you know, you could say Stalin was how powerful he was, but then you had people like Beria and Bloken who were just as powerful because of the, the amount of uh, information that they controlled. It was, uh, <sighs> It was almost like you you were dealing with not only Stalin at his level, but you had a couple people who were close in power as far as information went, and to be able to swing swing the sword um, as Stalin could. Yeah, absolutely. Facing an ongoing military debacle in Finland and the possibility of Allied aerial intervention in Transcaucasia or Allied naval strikes on the Soviet-occupied Petsamo, Stalin responded with a ruthless vigor. The first task was to shore up Soviet frontline positions in Finland, whatever the human cost. <laughs> Timoshenko, who had overseen the Eastern Polish campaign in September 1939, proved to be an inspired appointment. 
Basically giving up on the northern fronts, Timoshenko packed the main front with everything he had, massing nearly 600,000 troops on the narrow Karelian Isthmus, 2,800 guns, new tanks, including the heavy KV models that were almost invulnerable to Finnish tactics, Molotov cocktails in particular. Timoshenko's watchword for the assault was uninspiring but realistic, gnawing through. I just think about that. Think about the fact that they have to put that many men on one section of the border just to be able to accomplish something. The finish had the finish had something special. They really did. This is um, this the Russians proceeded to do, and not quickly. Timoshenko's uh, Karelian Isthmus assault launched February 1st with an initial artillery barrage of 300,000 shells lasted a month. Taipei, a scene of Russian humiliation in December, was pounded with 50,000 shells on February 13th alone, and somehow the Finns held on. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> By... <laughs> But by February 15th, the Red Army had broken through the Mannerheim line only for the Finns to pull back to an intermediate line of fortifications on February 18th, where they held out for another two weeks. On February 28th, Timoshenko ordered an all-out offensive on the intermediate line only for Mannerheim to preempt him by pulling back to a third defensive line such that the Red Army succeeded in conquering little but empty trenches. Thus far, the Russians had nearly lost 200,000 dead in Finland, and there was no sign the enemy was beaten. Just so, states, just, yeah. just think about that number. Almost, think about that number. Almost when a quarter we, of a million. Yeah, when we hear about like the total amount that have been lost on uh, either side in Russia, Ukraine, and you're talking about here, what is this? This is a month? Less than yes. a month? <laughs> It's, I mean, I'm, la- I'm laughing, but I'm not laughing. It's, it's, it's one of those things that you either laugh, you're going to laugh, or you're going to cry because it's just, that's startling. It's startling. Yeah, the, the, the war began in like the end of November, 1939. And so we're talking the end of February. So this is about three months worth yeah, of fighting, 200,000 yeah. dead. Yeah. With, with no sign your enemy is near defeat. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. The state of Finnish morale was summed up in a radio order on February 21st. If no relief comes, we will fight to the last man. The logic of attrition in, in this war between numerically mismatched opponents meant that if it continued on into spring and summer, Mannerheim would run out of warm bodies to man his trenches, even if morale did not crack. Timoshenko might not have won the war for Stalin, but he had removed the stain of humiliation. Salatory though Timoshenko's victories were, they did little to relieve Stalin's mind about the dangers of Allied intervention if the Finnish war lasted into spring. By the end of February 1940, British-French plans for sending an expeditionary force to Finland, composed of six British divisions alongside 15,000 French and Polish troops, were nearly complete. The first echelon was scheduled to leave France on March 2nd and arrive in Finland by March 12th or 13th. Allied planning for Operation Catherine, the amphibious operation in Norway, would be undertaken in early April, and also was conducted all through February and March 1940, along with the German counter-preparations that were, in their own way, just as alarming to Stalin, because they made a British-French move into Norway or Finland all the more likely. Narvik, a northern northern Norwegian port targeted in both Allied and German plans, was only 360 flying miles from Petsamo and only 400 miles from Murmansk. The last thing Stalin wanted to see was an encroachment of British Britain's formidable navy into Arctic waters anywhere near Petsamo or Murmansk, or British, French, or Polish boots on the ground in Scandinavia. We know today that the Allies' Finnish deployment fizzled out, but how the Norwegian campaign turned out, But no one knew this in February and March 1940, when the most likely scenario in the view of Britain's story to naval tradition was a series of successful British-escorted Allied amphibious landings in Norway to cut Hitler off from Sweden's uh, Galviar iron mines and in Finland to seize the nickel of Petsamo, then held by Soviet troops just miles away from the critical Soviet naval supply base at Murmansk. Again, just another timeline. Yeah, and it's you know the and then it's the switch you know or um what what was the word they used in uh in iraq the redirection 
there's so much redirection that happen that's happening at this time that uh you're i would assume the greatest political minds at the time if they had access to all this information they wouldn't be able to know what was happening they wouldn't be able to know what was going to happen one week to the next yeah again you know just like the fact that we have these these records is just tantamount to you know the degree of planning and in war planning that came into this and the concern that you know prior to the fall of france you know what was what was being considered and that for once you know the the attitude in the home office especially the war department was hitler's a problem right now we we could we could cripple the soviets for good um yeah yeah, and, yeah, but I mean, think things would change in a matter of weeks, but still, I mean, crazy yeah, things, to think about. Things could have changed very quickly if they would have just sided with the strongest army in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, bizarre talk about Baku was reaching fever pitch. With his vast intelligence apparatus, it was easy for Stalin to pick up the scent. In early March 1940, the Vots instigated queries at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, the neutral Americans were being viewed by all sides as the best informed on petroleum logistics, about the potential impact on Soviet oil produc production of an Allied bombing raid on Baku. Word of Stalin's query got out after American diplomats informed the Turks, who leaked the story to none other than the loose-tongued French ambassador in Ankara. The Russians, Rene Masili, told the British ambassadors in, in turn, are in a great panic about a possible bombardment of Baku from the air and asked the Americans' advice as to what exactly would happen in such an event and how great the damage would be. The Americans had replied that as the whole district was simply saturated with oil, there would be a blaze unequaled in the history of the world, and probably the damage would take a great many years to repair. Al Gore weeps. Yeah. <laughs> The timing of this pessimistic American report delivered to Stalin, coinciding as it did with the imminent dispatch of an Allied expeditionary force to Finland and the peaking of Allied chatter about Baku, is significant. On March 3rd, the U.S. ambassador in Moscow who had delivered this report to Stalin, Lawrence Steinhardt, warned the British embassy that Stalin is hypnotized by the bogey of an Allied intervention in the Caucasus while he is still entangled in Finland. In this state of nervous anxiety, Stalin made two critical decisions in sequence, the ramifications of which resonate to this day. The first came on March 5th, a date that should all resonate in the catalog of 20th century crimes against humanity. All winter, there had been rum rumblings about a great Stalinist purge of Polish prisoners, both in the sensitive areas near the new German frontier and the Gulag camps in the Soviet rear. On February 10th, the NKVD had conducted a series of raids in the frontier districts, yielding thousands more Polish prisoners. By this point, there were hundreds of thousands of Poles scattered around labor camps of the Gulag, including more than 20,000 military officers. Whereas the laborers for Beria's road-building projects in western Ukraine were drawn from ordinary Poles or enlisted men, captured officers and Polish government officials were held further back from the old Polish frontier and the labor camps a Staroblesk near Kharkov, 11,262 war prisoners, and Ostyshkov near Kalinin, Tever, northeast of Moscow, 15,991 prisoners. In Kozolesk, southeast of Smolensk, 2,284, and at more obscure sites like Yuza near Vologoda. Most of these labor camps for Polish elites were located in forests, far from rail connections, in order to guard against escape or communication with neighboring camps. I think everyone who's listening right now knows where this is going. Yeah. One might think that this geographic dispersion and the isolation of Polish, Polish officers and officials had effectively neutralized any organized Polish resistance movement inside the Soviet Union. This was not, however, to reckon with Stalin's hypersensitive precautionary mindset, nor with his almost perpetual loathing of Poles dating back to the Russian Civil War days. Like Hitler's anti-Semitism, Stalin's hatred of the Poles was such uh, was a perverse compliment, born of a grudging respect for their strength as a people, a people who had genuine, he had genuinely feared. Stalin had once told Yugoslav communist Milvon Dijlas that a nation which had been ruled out by powerful aristocracy or that had been ruled by powerful aristocracies like the Hungarians and the Poles were strong nations. Uh, sort of more of a reflection of how to rule uh, government and such. Stalin's fear of Hungarians and Poles 
Dijalas concluded, was revealing backhanded recognition of stamina. In view of the increasing numbers of Polish exile soldiers and pilots training in England and France for a possible deployment on the Western Front against Hitler or in either Finland or Transcaucasia against the Soviet Union, Stalin may not have been entirely wrong in his fearful assessment of the Polish threat to the Soviet regime. Yeah, all right, keep going. Yeah. On February 28, 1940, the first shoe dropped when Beria commissioned a study of the labor camps at Ostyshkov and Kolsak, demanding how to know how many Polish policemen, um, gendarmes, and officers were held in each location. A flurry of sinister NKVD directives followed, targeting categories such as soldiers and young non-commissioned officers of the former Polish army located in industrial labor camps. Polish officers of ranks of captain and above, including naval ones, 8,362, and Polish government officials, regime elements, and merchants, another 148, in all, Beria counted 14,736 Polish officers, officials, regime, freeloaders, policemen, soldiers, and jailers detained in interior gulag camps, of whom 97% were ethnically Polish. Beria totted up another 18,632 prisoners in the occupied western Belarusia and western Ukraine, of which 6,348 fell in the categories listed above augmented by 12,284 prisoners deemed to be spies, saboteurs, counter-revolutionary elements, and defectors. Because of the second lot of dangerous elements had been captured in the contested multi-ethnic border regions, Beria allowed that only 10,000 of these 18,632 were Poles. All of the Polish ex-officers, aristocrats, and bourgeois ex-regime officials, Beria informed Stalin, were lethal enemies of Soviet power who were carrying on, even in prison, with anti-Soviet agitation and counter-revolutionary work. Every one of these Poles, Beria warned, is just waiting to be liberated in order to allow to be allowed to actively participate in a battle against Soviet power. Making an exception for ethnic Germans and others protected by one of the few other regimes still friendly to Moscow, Beria recommended to Stalin in a top-secret NKVD directive number 794B, dated March 5, 1940, that 14,700 prisoners from the first interior camp list and another 11,000 prisoners from the second list, in all, 25,700 Polish officers and elites were to be rearrested and subjected to the highest measure of punishment, execution. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the whether the the threat was as grave as Beria said it didn't matter i mean Beria was he was an executioner he was more than happy he it seems from what i know of of reading about him that if there was a pro, if there was a problem with somebody and he had a question about it he'd rather just kill them so this was Hey, Sam, this is just nothing for him. Nothing for him. And we know that Stalin would have no problem with it at all. So, Yeah. Uh, anyways, we've got a, a a map here of the Soviet labor camps in European Russia. So we've got um, the Khaitan Forest Massacre site just outside of Smolensk. There's Minsk, Lvov, which is now in Ukraine. There's Kiev, Kharkov. But yeah, yeah. Um, Quite a hefty number of ethnic Poles, and they have not forgotten either, even to this day. No. While owing to the operation's geographical breadth and its complexity, it would take weeks for the NKVD to translate Beria's murderous directive into action. Once the order was given, there was no going back. Meanwhile, Stalin and Molotov cut the legs off Allied plans for military intervention in Finland or the Caucasus by suing for peace with Helsinki on terms far milder than anyone expected, especially Mannerheim, who informed his French liaison officer on March 12th that, absent Allied reinforcements, his men were too exhausted to fight on for more than two more weeks. Stalin did gain a bit more than he demanded before the war, and in in addition to Petsamo, Hankel, and various Baltic ports, Stalin acquired the entire Karelian Isthmus, where most of the bitter fighting had taken place, now styled as the Karelo Finland Soviet Socialist Republic. Soviet gains neutralized the Mannerheim line and provided strategic depth for Leningrad, though, as one Soviet officer lamented, we have won just about enough ground to bury our dead. 
but in Vipori or Vyborg and Helsinki were still Finnish, and there would be no Soviet military occupation. And the biggest climb down of all, the Soviet Finnish armistice signed on March 12th, made no mention of the Terejoki puppet government. In the view of exhaustion of Mannerheim's reserves, the armistice terms were the best the Finns could have hoped for. Finland had held out, preserving its independence, although Stalin did insist that Finland not be allowed to sign a defensive pact with Sweden and Norway, and preventing the worst. This is the best thing that he could do at that really? point. Yeah, he needed to divert, he needed to divert um, his energy somewhere else, and um, yeah, and <laughs> they were taking enough casualties there anyway, so um, yeah. I mean, I, suing for peace just sucked the oxygen of anti-Soviet sentiments right out of the war room. Yeah, well, you know, there was someone else who sued for peace on numerous occasions over the next few years, and mm -hmm. no, no one paid attention to it. <laughs> no one paid attention to him. <laughs> for all his manifold cruelties, the Vots had his moments, and this was one of them. His peace, in, his peace initiative in Finland may have been his most critical decision Stalin ever made in his entire career. At the time, Soviet diplomatic isolation was complete. Virtually the entire civilized world had united to condemn Stalin's war of aggression, and four major powers, Britain, France, Italy, and Spain, were on the cusp of armed intervention against the Soviet Union, along with five smaller ones in their wake. Hungary, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. And even the arch-neutral United States had declared a moral embargo on strategic exports to Stalin and raised money and arms, both privately and in Congress, for the Finnish defense. In view of what we now know about Stalin's superlative spy network, it is not likely a coincidence that Stalin made peace for Finland on March 12, 1940, the very day the first echelon of British-French-Polish troops were scheduled to arrive in Finland, at least in Allied planning documents. Mm. Stalin's relations with his German pact partners, too, had gone ice cold after he rejected an officious German offer to med mediate a settlement with Finland in February of that year. With the world against him, sw Stalin swallowed his pride, signed a disappointing peace treaty, and cut the legs out from underneath Allied intervention plans. The prospect of a grand alliance against the totalitarian dictators was moribund. Somehow, Stalin had escaped French and British hostility once again, leaving Hitler alone to fight the world's two largest empires. Stalin knew when to fold when he was holding a weak hand. And as grand as his ego was... In order to do this, I mean, it took. It just goes to show that you know, he he is described as a petty criminal, and we know he was a stagecoach robber and a bank robber when he was uh, when he was younger. But man, this was this was a stroke of genius. I, I would say this is one of the greatest political strokes of genius in the twentieth century. Yeah, I, I would agree, and I mean, like the last chapter covering the, the Finno-Russian war prior to the suing for peace, you know, McMeekin just outlines this like potential grand alliance between Japan, the, the Arab Muslim world, fascist Italy, Britain, France, and with some money from the U.S. to go to war with the Soviet Union. And he knew this. I mean, Stalin's spy network knew what was coming. I mean, to have verbatim text documents of what was being said by the highest officials, yeah. How do you not take advantage of that and make 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 them fight Hitler? I don't have to deal with you anymore. Goodbye. You know. Yeah, played it well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolute stroke of genius. Although the Finnish war was over, the wounds of the to, of, to the psyches of the Soviet leaders had not healed. The paranoia in Moscow was palpable. In a brutal speech before the Supreme Soviet on March 30th, Molotov lashed out at Chamberlain. Daladier, and the Labour Socialist supporters in Britain and France. He decried the Atlees and Blums, these lackeys of capitalism, who would unleash the barbarity and the bestiality of the white Finns. Dripping with sarcasm, Molotov described a series of mostly imaginary Finnish atrocities against Soviet prisoners of war as the fruits of the so-called Western civilization. Chamberlain's efforts to prolong the war in Finland, Molotov thundered, had given the world a glimpse of the dark side of his peace-loving imperialistic soul. But Molotov's deepest anger was reserved for Roosevelt and the so-called peace-loving USA, who claimed, with some justification, had armed the Finns to fight communism, even if only with a few dozen 
Brewster Buffalo Fighters and some cash. Could I um, say? Yeah, can, go for can it. You, uh, all right. When you look at most of the world leaders that we have now, and especially <clears throat> our our own leaders in our own country, could you imagine being in the hall when Molotov is delivering this speech? I mean, this is, we don't have, there aren't leaders like that anymore. No. I mean, I mean the, <clears throat> the hair on your arms would have been standing up, probably. And nobody talks like that anymore. It's nothing. Uh, it's all, it's no, just. No, no, one, no one talks like that with that kind of power. The, the manage, I mean, you just don't get that in, in managerial regimes. No. Yeah. I mean, as as entertaining as it is to, like, listen to Trump talk about how, like, we drone strike some ISIS leader and it's straight shit talk for 20 minutes. There's no power behind that because I know that there's, like, the Joint Chiefs, the generals, the soldiers, the State Department, the DOD. But I know if Molotov were to give an order and Stalin just nodded his head, Molotov's going to kill, like, 20,000 people. And that's power. I'm just, you know, like, I'd be terrified. Right around the time he's delivering this speech, Burnham's releasing the managerial revolution he's you know he's he's writing the managerial revolution predicting what's going to come (laughs) that people like this won't even exist in 75 years oh man (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's depressing as hell Uh, yeah it really like reading this book you just get this lump in your throat you're like oh man (laughs) What, what what 75 plus years of hindsight and history will do to a man? Uh, allied intervention or no intervention, the moment of maximum danger had provided Stalin with an excuse to do away with the entire hated class of aristocratic bourgeoisie, Polish officers and elites, and he was not going to miss it. In the first week of April 1940, thousands of Polish prisoners at the camps on Beria's list were rounded up and told that they were being returned to Poland. And Ostakov, the even there was even a ban to serenade prisoners as they were sent off to their deaths, to their deaths. Shipped in special trains and batches of a few hundred at a time, the men had not the slightest suspicion, one witness recalled, that they were in the shadow of Lady Death. One by one, the unsuspecting victims were escorted to soundproof cellars and then shot in the back of the head. Although most of the bodies were dumped in the Kaitin Forest, about 20 kilometers west west of Smolensk. The area area gave its name to the crimes after the corpses were discovered there by the Germans in 1943. The executions were mostly carried out in the cities. The bodies were then shipped for disposal in rural pits unlikely to be found. In Kalinin, Tver, the city northeast of Moscow near Ostrakov, Stalin's trusted NKVD butcher, Vasily Blokin, oversaw a team of 50 who shot hundreds of Poles each day. Thousands more Poles were murdered in Kharkov, located between the Polish prisoner camps at Kozlek and Strabolevsk. In all, 21,892 Polish war prisoners were sta- slaughtered by Stalin's executioners in April of 1940, including more than 15,000 army officers, 5,000 policemen, and nearly 2,000 government officials and business leaders. All but one of the victims were men. Roughly 8% were Polish Jews. For good measure, Beria had his NKVD squads track down the wives and children of the executed Poles, of whom 60,667 were counted, and deport them all to special labor camps in Kazakhstan. Parallel you know, to the... Yeah, go ahead. You know, it's um when you're reading about this and you're reading about these executions and just pulling out guns and shooting people, um, anyone who's studied the Spanish Civil War, which ran from 36 to 39... I mean, it's just, it's just a continuation. It's just one, one, five year, you know, and then of course it goes out to 1945. It's this 10 year stretch from like 35 to 45 of just execution after execution, after execution, after execution. It's, it's mind boggling to think of, the population reduction, the the violence, the not how now shall we live? How now shall we live if we think that um, it could be us the next day? Yeah, and it's it, truly when when you read that Hitler and you know and others 
believe that the peninsula was going to fall and it was going to fall to to Bolshevism, to this, what this is, you you really start to understand exactly what those men were doing. And, and, you know, historians treat it like this sort of bewildering factor, but, you know, Barbarossa kicks off in, in 41 and they start moving, you know, closer and closer to Moscow and, and closer and closer to, you know, Leningrad and Stalin, all, all these places that they're, they're wanting to take out all these like ethnic minority groups that aren't Russian are, are looking at them as liberators. You understand why when you read these numbers and to know that, 20,000 plus people just don't disappear, you know, overnight like that. And they don't come back and the families are moved. And this was going on. And I mean, it wasn't just the Poles. I mean, we, we saw this with the Ukrainians. We saw this with the Holom Demore. And we saw this with every story that, you know, Solzhenitsyn could write about or, you know, the the church that was still alive at the time, just recording more martyrs on the list for people that profess their faith. I mean, yeah, the, the Bolshevism at, at its most evil right here. And um, as we saw with this intelligence network, and as we kind of saw with the ideological victory in America during and after the war, Bolshevism won. Yeah. And that's the really, that's the most depressing part out of all of this is that it still won and it still claims thousands of lives to this day. Yeah. Parallel to the Khitan massacre, Beria ordered yet another Polish mass deportation. This time, 78,000 victims were Polish nationals absorbed into the Soviet Union in 1939 and 1940, who were so loyal to Poland that they had refused to accept Soviet identity papers and thus were easy to round up for deportation. In one of the myriad terrible injustices of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the vast majority of these patriotic Poles, about 84%, were Jewish refugees who had fled the German occupation zone to escape um, persecution, only now to disappear into the Soviet gulag. I mean... <laughs> Bad luck. I guarantee you a lot of them could have just joined the Wehrmacht. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, Allied war planning against the Soviet Union continued out of sheer bureaucratic momentum. There's that managerialism for you, baby. On the French side, this momentum was buttressed by the fall of Dadelier's government on March 21st, in large part because of the Premier's failure to do anything to save Finland, for which he was pilloried in the French Chamber of Deputies. Neville Chamberlain received a similarly harsh criticism in a grueling seven-hour session in the House of Con Commons on March 19th. Chamberlain, chastened, resolved a plot against Stalin more vigorously. A seven-hour prime minister question time. Ugh. You can't imagine David Cameron or Rishi Sunak get oh. chewed out for seven hours. Well, I mean, these were real leaders. They're, they're not yeah. managers. Yeah, real men. Um, yeah, so this is the Soviet caucus in spring 1940. You kind of see where the interest they would have is, had to fly yeah yeah you've seen the flight paths that they would have had to take yeah huh. mm. different world trans jordan uk down there yeah. love looking at, i love looking at older maps <laughs> yeah this is your uh sykes pico and you know yep agreement However illogical in diplomatic terms, the Allies came closest to waging war on the Soviet Union in the weeks after the Soviet Finnish armistice on March 12, 1940. Plans for bombing Soviet oil installations in Baku, later codenamed Operation Pike, were hashed out in Paris at the Supreme War Council on March 28th. One of the most notorious documents of the Masili affair dates on April 1st, 1940, when Masili reported that the Turkish government was willing to consider a defensive war against the Soviet Union, but not an offensive one. Masili thought that the Allies should, should not even ask Turkey for formal permission before bombing Baku. If they had to violate Turkish airspace, the Turks could protest and deny responsibility. <laughs> In late March and early April 1940, just as Beria's NKVD began rounding up Stalin's Polish Gulag prisoners for shooting, the British Air Ministry's long-planned surveillance of Soviet oil installations at Baku and Batumi was carried out by a daredevil pilot named Hugh MacPhail. 
taking off from northern Iraq in a twin-engine Lockheed 14 Super Electra called the Cloudy Joe. To provide political cover, McPhail and his co-pilot wore civilian clothing and carried civilian passports, and the RAF and the RAF markings were removed from the plane. The Cloudy Joe penetrated Soviet airspace over Baku at 1145 a.m. on March 30th, 1940, and circled the city for over an hour while a brave photographer, Alan Tubby Dixon, dangled himself through the emergency panel on the plane's floorboard to snap pictures of Baku's oil installations and the city's still mercifully minimal Soviet air defenses. <laughs> the f- no wonder he was, no wonder Stalin was so worried. <laughs> no defenses out there. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm opening this up in a new tab so we can can look at it like the Lockheed uh, Super Electra. I'm just going to open this image right here so people can see. Yeah, see the original file. Um, you know, this is what this is the Super Electra. You know, th- this is not a this is not a warplane in any stretch of the imagination. Um, but yeah, easy to just uh, take your pictures and fly over. Um, but yeah. Uh, Crazy. Still minimal. Yeah, the, the photo suggested that because the wood and oil derricks along the Caspian were placed only 70 yards apart, incendiary bombs could easily ignite a general conflagration of the entire petroleum-saturated area. Encouraged by this intelligence, on April 1st, the British Air Ministry ordered four squadrons of Bristol Blenheim Mark IV bombers, 48 in all, to reinforce Britain's Middle East Command in Iraq. There was no causative connection between McPhail's mission and the Khitan massacre, but the specter of British armed intervention must have steeled Stalin's nerve as he carried out one of his greatest crimes. In fact, the Soviet anti-aircraft guns in Batumi, on stricter alert after the failure in Baku, opened fire on McPhail's Cloudy Joe on April 5th, launching three salvos that successfully came closer to the aircraft, although all of them missed. This was the day that the Poles were rounded up, at Starbolesk and the second largest officer camp on Beria's target list, the NKVD emptied out the largest of the camps, Oshtakov, the following day. McPhail's surveillance photographs can still be found in the British archives, providing a glimpse into an alternative war in which the war machines of Stalin and Hitler might have slowly ground to a halt for the lack of oil in the weeks after May 15, 1940. On that date, the French Middle Eastern Command in Syria had hoped to deliver the hammer blow against the Soviet petroleum industry if the dithering Chamberlain and the half-hearted British government he headed were ever given the go-ahead. But the Allies missed their chance. Just when it seemed that the powerful forces were gathering to put Stalin's murderous tyranny out of commission, Beria's massacres decapitated a potential internal Polish-led resistance movement, while Stalin's astute climb down in Finland had denied the Allies along with Italy, Hungary, the United States, and other neutral powers, cause for going to war with him. It had been a close call for communism and its existential struggle with the capitalist world, but Stalin's wiles had seen off real and potential threats and restored the Soviet position. With a timely assist from his alliance partner in Berlin, Stalin would soon resume the offensive. It's amazing that the two things that they mention there, the the two things that allowed them to basically succeed. One is what you would expect from them, mass slaughter. And the other is basically backing down. (laughs) I mean, the two opposite ends of the spectrum, I guess there's some kind of yin and yang in that, that, uh, that allowed them to, uh, take that as a, a win right there at that moment. Yeah, and uh, of course, for the, the next chapter, chapter nine, um, the Baltic Bessarabian Bukovina, Charlemagne and I will be diving into that and how the Baltic states are just given the the the, the diplomatic grab ass and, you know, being held hostage uh, in, in, in the Kremlin, basically saying like, yeah, you're going to surrender your sovereignty now. And again, the, these strokes of genius of just having a supremely you know, one of the best intelligence networks of the 20th century and um, killing off any resistance and then, you know, giving them no reason to go to war with you over Finland anymore. Like, um, you know, for as much characterization, like you were saying, like that we give Stalin, you know, whatever you want to say about him. I mean, the the man knew how to lead and knew what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. If Lenin had, you know, not gotten sick and died, yeah, you, you you wonder what kind of direction you know the 
let's say the let's play what could have been, but how Lennon would have uh, would have led because I mean, at this point Lennon would still be alive. Yeah, would he still be in power? That's the question because we saw everything that happened, and um, I wouldn't say that a purge would hit the um, you know would hit the chancellor, but uh, or the, <laughs> would hit would hit um, the top, but. Who knows? Who knows? It would be interesting to see how Lenin would have hand, handled all of this. Really, in- indeed, and we probably wouldn't have gotten the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact that we that we know, if at all, if if Lenin was still around. But again, these are things left known only to God. Um, yeah. Well, Mister Quinones, uh, any final thoughts or comments that you want to add here? Um, and uh, where can people find your excellent work? Uh, the Picanona show, all podcatchers. I'm back on YouTube for some reason. Uh, I, maybe they want to keep an eye on me. Um, <laughs> PeteSubstack.com, the Old Glory Club. Uh, please check out the Old Glory Club and uh, go and subscribe on YouTube. Check out the Substack. Uh, I think Prude does some great work there as well. <laughs> I'm a part of the old glory club. I can't endorse it enough for what we're doing. We're getting our chapters going, getting like-minded gentlemen together to, you know, be as fraternal and as friendly as possible. And the Pony Express radio every Thursday at uh, 7 PM Eastern. It's a great time. What I will say when it comes to books like this, when it comes to, you know, the kind of books that I read and talk about on the show, I really believe that, uh, one of my goals, which I won't achieve before I leave this mortal coil, is I want to destroy the the myth of World War II, that it's the good war, that it's the, the war that the United States needed to fight, especially on the European front, mostly on the European front and um, in the European theater. And if somebody does decide, well, it needed to be fought, then hopefully they understand that... Uh, maybe the guns were pointed in the wrong direction and, and that, and that, and I, I will take this to my grave that the founding myth of this country, the um, declaration of independence, even the constitution, the bill of rights was replaced by the, the narrative of world war two. And that ever since world war two, that's the narrative that we've been living under. And that is not a narrative of um, liberty. That is not a narrative of um, what the founders had in mind. And I will do everything I can, even if I have to do it one person at a time, to destroy that myth of World War II. Because until it gets destroyed, and I think there is hope, you know, when we look at... uh, the generations, their opinions of Israel, how it goes from boomer at like 80% down to zoomer at like 20%, 25%. Um, there's hope that that myth will, will die over time, but uh, try and make it, make it die a little bit sooner before I leave. Yeah. I, I, I like how there's the little tweet by Kofi Fanon that he, he pulls out every now and then he's just like, you know, it, it's that simple. Bolshevism won out in this war um and it it kind of found a a nice happy landing here in the united states during and after the second world war and the cold war and uh, you know texts like these you know this isn't sean mcmeekin ain't a david irving character or whatever but when you when you read this and you understand what you were up against with bolshevism international communism how there's little to no difference between uh, leftism and say a social democracy and a and a full-throated bleeding communist um, you, you really begin to recognize what kind of threat to your liberty, your freedom in your country is really out there. And, um, you know, people can call you whatever, but uh, the Cold War didn't really end because you were still fighting a war against Bolshevism that's been there since the revolution of 1917. And that war has never stopped. Yeah. Um, you mentioned David Irving there. I would mention just as an aside, I got an email from his daughter. Um, he's in the hospital. He's sick. So pray for, pray for Mr. Irving. Hmm. 
Well, Mr. Quinones, your links will be down below in the description to the wonderful patrons, subscribe star supporters, and YouTube channel members that who are listening to this early. Again, go support Pete and his wonderful work. For those of you who are listening after this video goes public, you can see videos like these early, along with some other great uh, you know, patron goodies of seeing interviews and stuff early behind the scenes over at Subscribestar, Substack, and other wonderful platforms where you can provide financial support. All down below, the links in the description. Until then, um, this concludes this chapter in Sean McMeekin's 2021 Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. Pete Quinones, thanks so much for coming on. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Prude. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anytime.